Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. Can you see this background? This week, we had a vacation Bible school with 250 kids and 100 volunteers. Isn't it amazing? We believe the Holy Spirit has been working within us. So we believe God will encounter you through this worship service as well. So now let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Let us go before God in our opening congregational prayer. The word will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, you have created us, redeemed us, and called us to be co-workers in your mission. Jesus, deepen our discipleship so that we can make disciples of all nations. Holy Spirit, transform us so that we can take part in the transformation of the world. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my great privilege to get to lead us in prayer today. Will you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Holy and loving God, thank you for gathering us together in your name. God, we thank you that your love and power is big enough that you are able to unite us in your presence, even when we are apart in time and space. Thank you that you are in the business of transformation. You never give up on us, even when we think you should. And even more, you call us to work with you. As you transform us, we're part of the transformation of the world. God, we thank you today for all those here at Wrightsville who have said yes to working with you, who have given of their time and their talents to help us all to grow in our faith. For our Sunday school teachers, confirmation mentors, children's ministry helpers, 412 youth faith keepers, small group leaders, vacation Bible school helpers, and so many more. Jesus, you taught us that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So God, please continue to call people to this work and give them the courage to say yes. We pray even for anyone who, as they hear this prayer, feel the stirring of the call on their hearts. We pray for our community of Wrightsville Beach and Wilmington. God, let the scales fall from our eyes so we can see our town the way you see it. Help us celebrate what you celebrate and grieve what grieves you. Help us see the needs of others and give us imagination to see a different way forward instead of just keeping things the way they've always been. We pray for your world. Lord, in a world that is so often struck by war, help us remember that we are citizens of the kingdom of God before we're citizens of a nation and that we are called to be obedient to you above obedience to an ideology. Lord, we pray especially today that your peace would break through in Israel and Gaza. And God, we pray for all those whose needs are especially close to our hearts today, and we lift them up before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, but you listen to them. And we know that you are faithful and trustworthy. And so trusting in your unfailing love, help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you can't tell from our surroundings, we have just finished an incredible week at Vacation Bible School here at Wrightsville, where we had over 250 kids who got to learn scripture stories and hear about God's love for them. What you might not know is that those children did not have to pay a single penny to participate in this incredible ministry. And that's possible because of the continued generosity of our congregation. When you give to Wrightsville, those are the types of programs that you are supporting. And we'd love to be able to continue all of these and to continue to grow. So as we transition now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd like to remind you as always that you can always give to the Ministry of Wrightsville UMC by mailing a check and also by using our website, wrightsvilleumc.org. Let's now continue to worship God. Hi, 
Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today, I have something very simple with me. It's just a piece of paper. There's a lot that we could do with this piece of paper, but right now it just feels kind of plain, doesn't it? Well, I think we should try to turn it into something else. What do you think we could do to turn it into something else? Can we turn it into something else? I've been thinking a lot recently about how God can take things and turn them into something else. Especially how God can take us and turn us into different kinds of people. People who are more loving and who care more for other people. And that God can take us even when we feel like Maybe there's not a lot of things that we know that we're good at. And God can give us some sort of really cool and special job. Did you know that actually happened to a character in the Bible? His name was Saul. And Saul really wanted to serve God. But Saul was really wrong about what that means. He thought that... It meant going to church a lot and knowing the Bible really well. But he didn't know that it also meant loving Jesus. In fact, he really didn't like Jesus. And he spent his time trying to keep people who loved Jesus from telling other people about Jesus. Until one day, something crazy happened. Saul was on the road walking, probably on his way to go hurt some more people who love Jesus. And suddenly a huge blinding light came and he fell down on the ground. And a voice came and said, Saul, Saul, why are you hurting me? And Saul didn't know who it was, so he said, who are you? And the voice said, it's Jesus who you're hurting. Then Jesus sent Saul to go into town and to meet with someone named Ananias. And Ananias taught Saul about who Jesus is. And all of a sudden, Saul was able to understand who Jesus is and how much Jesus loved him. And you know, Jesus even gave him an important job to go out and tell other people about God's love through Jesus. And he made a huge, huge difference in our church. In fact, he changed his name to Paul, and he wrote more than half of the New Testament. Isn't it amazing what God could do with someone who didn't really seem to be on God's side in the first place? Maybe if Saul was like this plain piece of paper, God made Paul into something like this, something different and something more beautiful and amazing. I wonder what God might be up to around you. And I hope you know that God has a plan for you and God probably has a special job for you to do. I wonder if you can ask God and help work to listen to God and hear God's voice. I'm so grateful for all that God does to transform us so that we can love God more. Let's say a prayer together. We're gonna do an echo prayer. So I'll say a line and I'd like you to pray it back with me. Let's pray now. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for transforming me. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello everyone, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And 
It's great to be able to be with you today. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us. We're continuing our series through the summer on the book of Acts, and we've now reached chapter 9, the really important story of Paul's conversion. So let's check it out, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, that's what he went by originally, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he was going along and approaching Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him, with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, like you did to Saul, open our eyes so that we might see. Open our ears so that we might hear. Open our hearts so that we might embrace your love. In Jesus' name, amen. A brilliant light flashes. It strikes like lightning. Paul is shocked by a charge from heaven, and he's knocked off his horse. A voice speaks to Paul out of nowhere, and it holds his attention with a vice-like grip. Paul is converted. The persecutor becomes the preacher. The surprising element of this event is the realization that the conversion of Paul is the conversion of a person who is already very, very religious. Paul was the best of believers, the master of morality. He lived out every letter of the law. He was a superior student of the scriptures. He was a dedicated defender of the demands of the law. And yet, he was converted. For most of us, this fact undermines the very foundation of our understanding of the concept of conversion. From the social point of view, we associate conversions with rogues, rascals, and reprobates. From the intellectual point of view, we think that conversion is what happens to unbelievers, agnostics, skeptics, and cynics. From the missionary point of view, we think that conversion is concerned with pagans, heathens, and idol worshipers. Religious conversion in general is for the ungodly, the wicked, and well, you know, sinners. The character of Paul fits into none of these categories. Paul's conversion was the conversion of an enthusiastic believer who was already totally committed to God. This is important. Paul's single ambition in life was to be a dedicated and obedient servant of God's holy law. And yet, Paul was converted. Not to the dark side of the force, but to the light of the gospel. The explanation of this strange fact is that Paul's conversion was not a moral or ethical conversion, it was a theological conversion. It was a conversion from death under the law to life in the gospel. 
In order to more completely understand the theological dimensions of Paul's conversion, we need to review the story from our text. A man whose name was Saul had dedicated his life to the persecution and the actual killing of Christians in an all-out effort to destroy the early church. And this same man, who will later go by Paul, was on his way to Damascus in Syria, one of the oldest cities in the world. His heart is motivated by malice. His mind is dead set on murder. Paul is convinced that he is commissioned by God to destroy all the fool-hearted followers of that mad Messiah, that pretentious peasant, the son of a village carpenter, that common nobody who had made the blasphemous claim that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. Paul was just outside the city when suddenly a blinding light flashed like a bolt of lightning from the heavens. It's the middle of the day, but this light is brighter than the sun. Paul's literally knocked off his high horse, and he lays prostrate on the ground. And like thunder after the lightning, a voice rumbles around him saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's not an angry voice. It's a deep and resonant voice of profound and passionate concern. And when the voice goes silent, Paul breaks the stillness with his guilt-induced question, Who are you, Lord? And the amazing answer comes back, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's significant that when our Lord identified himself to Paul, he used his earthly human name, Jesus. It's as if our Lord wanted it to be perfectly clear to Paul that the one who spoke to him was the same that was the baby born in Bethlehem, the child of the carpenter of Nazareth, the young man who had been rejected and eventually crucified in Jerusalem. It's the Jesus of the Galilee who had been raised and exalted by Paul's very own God who is speaking to him now. The tremendous truth and stark reality of this experience that engulfed Paul like a tidal wave was that this conversion experience would sweep all the lies which had marked and motivated his life up until now. Jesus reprimanded and charged Paul with the full force of the law. Paul was judged and found guilty. For all intents and purposes, Paul was experiencing a spiritual death on the road to Damascus. It's often said that Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, and strictly speaking, this is not the whole truth. The truth is that his conversion experience only happened at the beginning on the road to Damascus. The conversion of Paul, like all conversions, comes in multiple acts. The first act is dying to the life he once had. The second act was being raised to the new life in Jesus. Paul was experiencing what he would later proclaim in his preaching, that the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. And the first act, the sign of Paul's experience of death, was his blindness. Our text states, when his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So the irony of ironies is that this proud and boastful conqueror for God, who had set out for Damascus with a mission to kill Christians and eradicate the church, was led into the city like a Poor, blind beggar. The second act of Paul's conversion occurred while he was in Damascus. It was time to take on the new life God had in store for him. Ananias, directed by God, placed his hands upon Paul's head. He absolved him of all his sins, and he commanded him to no longer persecute Christians. And instead, he commissioned Paul to go and preach about the living Lord, Jesus the Christ. The Holy Spirit entered into Paul. The scales fell from his eyes. His sight was restored. He was baptized. He ate food with other Christian followers. And therefore, after being fully nourished and strengthened by food and the Spirit of God, Paul immediately goes to the nearest synagogue where he begins to preach that Jesus has been crucified and raised on the third day. Paul was converted by the grace of Jesus Christ. However, one more act needs to be added to this drama of Paul's conversion. One more step needs to be stressed. 
It's this final act that points out what Paul's conversion means to all of us today. This third act, the final step of Paul's conversion, was conversion of the word that he had heard into the energetic life that he's now going to live. Before his conversion, Paul was already an ardent student of the word. That is, the Holy Scriptures that we know as the Old Testament. It's this word that was his driving force in life. Paul was an energetic, enthusiastic, dedicated doer of the word. Nothing wrong with this word. Paul was just misusing and misunderstanding the point of the word. He understood it literally. He didn't understand it spiritually. So God decided to get his attention another way. That ever happened to you? Happens to me a lot. My wife will tell me to do something over and over and over again, and I kind of shrug it off. And then I hear the same thing from my doctor, or maybe even on TV, and I go, oh, you know, I should really be doing that. And my wife just puts her face in her hands and says, I've been telling you this for years. Sometimes you just need to hear the right message from a second source. So God sent the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ himself, to tell Paul to stop persecuting Christians and instead to proclaim the message of God's grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul's conversion redirected his energies, it transformed his life, but the old word and the new word had both motivated Paul to action. The old word that Paul was misusing led Paul to persecute Christians. The new word that spoke directly to him, so that he wouldn't misunderstand this time, led him to proclaim a new life of faith, hope, and love. Now this third act of Paul's conversion, that's the one we all so desperately need. We all need this conversion of our conviction into action, from dedication into deeds. We need to let the power of the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ radiate through us into the energetic lives of faith that we live. It's like harnessing the gravity pull of a giant waterfall into electric power in order to light our homes. It's like harnessing the sunlight as solar energy to heat our homes. The power is there, but somehow it's got to be transformed. It needs to be converted from one form of power to another. The tragedy of our lives is that somewhere along the power line, the energy of the Word gets short-circuited. And the conversion of energy never takes place. As transformers of the word, we fail. And most likely, the fuse-blowing point of our failure rests in our pride. We're afraid of what others will think about us, or what they'll say about us if we become too enthusiastic about our faith. Nobody wants to be labeled a do-gooder, a fanatic, a religious nut. We don't want to be labeled or laughed at, so we play it cool. You know, we adopt an air of sophistication. We become blasé, which causes us never to get excited about anything. Far too often, we go through life anxiously looking in the rearview mirror to see what others are thinking about us, while all the while, we keep our lives in first gear and never shift into high gear. No danger here. We're just chilling, kind of dull. The power of the Word of God never converts into enthusiastic action in our lives. For far too quickly, we short-circuit it into carefully worded, well-guarded, very conservative expressions of our faith. We never risk radical involvement or commitment. We play it safe. And this tragic short-circuiting of the power of the Word of God prohibits us from ever being converted into energetic believers. And it robs us, not only of knowing the full joy of a dynamic faith, but also of experiencing a truly Christian style of life. For example, take forgiveness, or love, or service to others. Actions which clearly characterize the active will of God in our lives. Well, without enthusiasm, 
these actions never quite measure up to what the New Testament's talking about when it uses these words. Forgiveness without enthusiasm becomes a duty that's just begrudgingly done. Love becomes just another law to be obeyed. Service becomes a dreaded demand, which we practice like some dull discipline, rather than it being a deed we're delighted to do. Without enthusiasm, God's will becomes a series of tasks that we must do. We actually exhaust ourselves trying to do it all. In reality, they are things we could do joyfully because we're plugged into this powerhouse of unlimited energy which constantly flows from the Word of God. But before this sermon ends, I want you to be sure that you are not drawing the conclusion that this sermon is some sort of you should, you must kind of sermon which makes an appeal or demand for you to go and do something. I do that all the time, but not today. Okay? The intention of this sermon is to place no demands upon you as a listener whatsoever. The intent of this sermon is to confront you with a you will message. The theme of this sermon is not a demand. Instead, it is a declaration. It is a promise from God that He will not rest until the current is restored to our lives and until His Word flows through us and moves us into expressive actions of faith. In our text, Paul didn't go to Damascus to be converted. Our text is not about what Paul did. Rather, it's about what God did to Paul. God is the primary actor in the story of salvation. God writes, directs, produces, and stars in the drama of conversion. It's God who knocked Paul from his horse to the ground. It's God who blinded Paul with the judgmental word of the law. It's God who restores his sight with the gift of the gospel. It's God who forgave and blessed and commissioned Paul. It's God who is determined to do the same thing to you and me. God will strike again and again with his word of grace until that word makes contact and becomes active in our lives. The word of God's like lightning. It doesn't strike when we want it to. We cannot by any power of our own will or self-determination cause lightning to occur. Lightning strikes when the conditions are right. And so it is with the word of God. In God's good time, we will experience the striking surge, the power of his word in our lives. And then we will express our faith in action. Look up. The clouds are gathering. The winds are changing. There's that refreshing scent in the air. The heavens are charged with power. Any moment now, there's going to be a bolt from the blue and our lives are going to be radically changed. The word of God that we hear will be electrified into new energy for the lives that we live. Warning. Word of God is about to strike. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we've been studying your word and listening for your voice. Lord, whether we are headed in the right direction or going in the wrong way, I pray that you will touch us again, that your word will strike us, and that we will be motivated, and that we will take your power and be moved to action through your spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I think we all want a word from God. God is still speaking. He's speaking to us today just like he did to Paul and just like he did to so many others back in the Bible. He's still speaking today. And when he does speak to you, he's going to bring power. 
So I pray that you will take his direction and you will move in the direction that he's called you to. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.